Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another fun adventure. Coffee's ready. Oh, look at that. We now got nice little uh, Christmas holiday spirit coffee cups now. That's fun. Okay, we're back. Let's go. We're going to go get our assignments. We're going to make sure what we got to do today. Let's have some fun. Okay, let's see now. We got these gates. Let's go wake these airplanes up. You know, somebody I think asked me one time, I said, Stig, why do the flight control services droop like that? Why are they all hanging down like that? Shouldn't they be nice and streamlined? Well, the thing is, hydraulics are not pressurized. So when hydraulics are not pressurized, flight control surfaces like this, like this aileron, it droops. There's no hydraulic pressure behind it. See, just like that. But as soon as hydraulics get introduced, That'll straighten right out. This is very common when it comes down to fly-by-wire aircraft. But there are other aircraft that do droop their flight control surfaces that are direct control. In fact, if you've ever seen a classic 727 or even a classic 737, and you look at the leading edge inboard, the Kruger flaps, you would actually see those droop down. Obviously, this is not drooping down, but those classic models, They'll usually droop down right there. There you go, that's what it looks like. So back in those days when I was working on the old classics, especially the 727s and the 737s, those leading edge Kruger flaps would droop down. Obviously when we're performing maintenance, we're walking around the aircraft, but sometimes hydraulics have to get pressurized. So everybody would call out, hydraulics coming up. And everybody knew to stay away from the Kruger flaps because they snap back into place. Yeah. Nah. Good old memories. But once hydraulics are pressurized, they go right back up. Oh my Lord. Look at that. I told you, you gotta stop and smell the roses. And it doesn't have to be airplanes all the time. A beautiful sunrise will do just fine. Alrighty, first office. Let's see now. Looks like they already got this one powered up. Let's get it going, check the logbook. Make sure everything's A-OK. -okay. Check the lights. Go through parameters. The huge. Yeah, everything's good. These are just your standard faults because, as always, the Adaroo system is not aligned yet. But uh, yeah. Engine oils, hydraulics, all within uh, nominal levels. Let's cage this artificial horizon. This is one of our old America West 319s, and we call these the basic models. Don't get me wrong, the computer systems, everything is up to date, everything is functioning as normal. It's just some of the equipment still stayed analog. That equipment works perfectly fine. I'm sure at one point they will update the whole fleet to a modernized standard where it becomes an enhanced model where you have everything that is digital. But for these older model aircraft, they just keep the basics on there. It still gives the proper information The pilots know how to use it. I mean, this airplane has been around since uh, 2005 when I checked it, and that's getting pretty up there for an Airbus 319. But she's still solid as a rock. Good bird. Here's a fun one for you. Check this out. This is where on the Airbus 320 family, the standby compass exists. That's where it lives. It's also got a little light right here. By the way, that's a no-go light, especially in nighttime operations. If that light is not working, <laughs> we cannot dispatch the aircraft. Funny, right? You can ground an airplane for one little light bulb. This is kind of funny. Well, let me rephrase this. Not funny to passengers because nobody wants to ground an airplane for a light bulb, but this is funny to maintenance and pilots because we're kind of we have a bit of a cynical humor. And um, when we see this kind of stuff and the rules and regulations and <laughs> for a light bulb to ground an airplane is quite comical. But it's there for a reason. You know, it's there for safety. It's a, it's a piece of a redundancy that has to be there. I, I You can even ground an airplane over a sticker or a placard, a very specific one. But yeah, it, the, these are the rules we have to abide by. It might sound silly to a passenger or the, to the flying public in general, but that's the way it works. Something very minute 
that's something that might seem insignificant, but in a case of emergency, it becomes very significant, hence why it's a grounding item. But not only does it control a light right here, it also controls a light on the ice indicator on the outside. Let me show you. You probably won't be able to see it because it's too bright. Check this out though. Right there. That's the ice indicator. So what happens is if ice starts building up, the pilots will see it right there building up. And that is what it looks like when ice builds up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's how they do it on the Airbus. Little ice indicator. And there's a little light inside there as well. A very concerned commenter asked me one time, Stig, how could you just open and close windows like that? Oh my goodness, what happens if they open that in flight? It, they, they can't, it's, it's impossible. It, remember, it, the aircraft is pressurized. Pressure is built up within the aircraft. The way windows and doors work on aircraft is a plug style. There's more pressure on the inside of the aircraft than there is on the outside of the aircraft. So when the windows and doors are a plug style covering or closure, the pressure from the inside is going to push on those things. So if you have around almost eight PSI D, PSI differential pressure from the inside to the outside, yeah, don't worry. You, if, nobody's gonna open those doors or windows. Uh, you'll break the handle before you open those things. This is good to go. On to the next one. And here's our next office. This one's just coming up from the hangar and it's going ETOPS. I believe this is going to OGG. So we're just gonna perform a final ETOPS check. The preliminary has already been done by uh, the earlier shift. So not bad, should be easy. And the impressive super tug right there. All right, let's go through it. Let me do a quick little walk around, make sure everything's okay. Get the cargoes opened up. Already did the first forward one over there. Go take care of the aft. Oh, looks like it's turning out to be a beautiful day today. Open sesame. There you go. Okay, once it's fully open and locked on the 320 family, you also have to look for this little indication. The little green light means the door is fully up and locked. Hello, anybody home? Woohoo! <laughs> Let's see. Looking fine, looking fine. Let's see. Very nice. I love how close tolerance these things are. Forgive the crusty fingers right there, but let's go through a little bit of knowledge here. As I mentioned, look how close tolerance the gap is right there. It almost would seem like the blade actually is touching that area. And believe it or not, sometimes it is. To be more specific, that gray area that you're seeing is called the abradable liner. It's actually meant to deteriorate. You see, at high centrifugal forces, these blades start to expand. They stretch. In the past, when they used older technology materials, such as nickel-based super alloys for blades, blades would have a tendency to creep. And now I gotta explain what blade creep means. <laughs> it's all right, we'll make this really easy. It's the natural tendency of the blade due to centrifugal forces to expand and stretch. All blades do this, but we don't wanna see excessive creep because it could lead up to creep failure. Don't be panicked by this, we monitor this. This is why engines have vibration monitors. New modern blades such as carbon fiber that you're looking at right there or titanium alloys, those have a less of a tendency to creep. But they do still expand just a bit. Which brings me back to the abradable liner. Over a long period of time, these blades will slowly stretch out. 
and they will start scuffing this abradable liner. If the deterioration becomes excessive, at that point we will change fan blades. This also assists in the acoustics of the engine. There's also panels in front and behind the abradable liner, which are called acoustic liner basically. Makes the engine more quiet. But yeah, that's about it for that. Let's keep on going. Yeah. Amazing, amazing engineering. A quick little peek into the cargo pit. Let's go. Making sure everything's secure. Make sure the netting is good and no damage. Nothing really fancy or special, just a good GVI, general visual inspection. Check the smoke detectors. Blow off panels. These panels are actually very important. In case of rapid decompression, these panels will pop out and equalize the pressure between the cabin and the cargo. What it basically is for is to prevent structural failure of the fuselage. Some reason people think cargo pits are not pressurized. They are guys, they're pressurized. Good morning. Breakfast burrito. Breakfast, burrito. Breakfast, burrito. Yeah. Breakfast of champions. I'm sad to see those things go. <laughs> A small little side note and a bit of stig philosophy you know i encounter lots of people especially pilots and flight attendants and majority of them are good-hearted sweet people they love their job they love aviation i always try to approach them with kindness and respect they're people doing their jobs just like i am you know a little joke here and there a smile a good morning could make a big difference in somebody's day but not everything is sunshine and rainbows sometimes people just have a bad day and that's all right too give them a pass Overall, what I'm trying to say is just treat people as you would want to be treated. It's pretty easy. All right, let's see now. Uplink is complete. APU is running up. Good. I finally got a close-up view of the visual docking guidance system. It's pre-programmed to multitude of aircraft. Once it's set for the particular aircraft that's coming in, it will capture the signature and then guide the aircraft in. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it works off of lasers and cameras. It basically captures the image of the aircraft and uses certain things as reference points, such as wingtips, nose gear, and it gives the pilot a visual cue to turn left or right to get on the center line. That's about it. go back to the 737 a quick little walk around make sure everything's okay there we go a little grease there let's see those things are nose wheel stoppers the technical name is nose landing gear wheel spin brake when aircraft takes off the nose wheels are still spinning so when the gear goes up it touches those pads and stops the nose wheel from spinning hence you see all the rubber being flung onto the forward bulkhead right there which gives me the opportunity to have fun and send it with love. Let's go. And of course, give it a little bit of love. Look at this thing. Oh my goodness, the patch is on us. This one must have gotten damaged real hard, but they put a, look at how many doublers they put. Okay, before anybody has a panic attack over here. Yes, aircraft do get damaged on the ground sometimes and aircraft maintenance has the capacity to repair such damage. This poor 737 took a nice beating right there. Look at all those doubler patches. Trust me, all of this is approved by the manufacturer. We have repair manuals just for this. It's called SRM, Structural Repair Manual. An aircraft gets pressurized, tested, you name it. Sometimes when aircraft get excessively damaged where it's impossible to put a doubler like this, it can actually reskin the whole aircraft or the damage portion, I should say. But this is perfectly acceptable as well. It just doesn't look pretty. That's about it. Now on the other side, I noticed again something else. See these big oversized rivets? This occurs because of lightning strikes. And yes, aircraft get lightning strikes. Lightning has a tendency to bounce around, especially with through rivets. And it'll pop the rivets out or score them and damage them. 
So another approved repair is to pop out or get the old rivet out and put an oversized rivet right there. From the looks of it, this poor airplane went through the gauntlet. Oh my goodness. But she's still strong, she's still flying. These airplanes can take a lot more punishment than you think. They're very tough. A uh, quick little look in a forward cargo. There you go. We got a nice little light switch for you. I already checked the aircraft. We already did a walk right. I'm just showing showing it off to you guys. Brakes and tires looking good. Hey, look, this is what the inside of my brain looks like. <laughs> Some component location. Those two big tanks right there are your hydraulic reservoirs for system A and B. And then you got your hydraulic pumps, electrically driven system A and B as well. That's your PTU, power transfer unit. These are hydraulic fuses. That is the reserve reservoir. That's the gauge for your brake accumulator pressure. A quick little look at the flap track system. The torque tubes lead up to the transmission and the transmission goes to a jack screw. And that's what unwinds and that's how your inboard flaps drop. Right down below right here, you're going to see the thrust reverser control system, the control valve module. There's two of them and they got handles on them to deactivate the thrust reverser when needed. That green thing right there is an electric motor that's attached to the trailing edge flap power drive unit. It allows the flaps to be lowered electrically when needed. Top left corner are your engine fire bottles and a slew of cables because this aircraft is still a direct control aircraft. Are you tired of listening to me yet? <laughs> I could do this all day long. Oh, something really interesting right here. Let's pause this. You see that yellow stripe right there, right at the base of the strut? That actually means something. So over time when aircraft go through various phases of landing, taking off, landing and taking off, you get deterioration as well as sometimes get corrosion within the strut. When aircraft goes into heavy overhaul maintenance, these components get all pulled apart. When corrosion or damage is discovered within the strut, they will pull it all apart and then oversize it. And that's exactly what that yellow band means. That means it's been overhauled. They can do this only a couple of times. If I remember correctly, I believe only maximum three times you can oversize a strut like that. After which, that strut is toast. You need a, basically a brand new one. So there you go. A uh, little bit of a trivia for you, just in case somebody asks you. <laughs> All right, let's keep on going. Let's see. Everything looking good. She's a good bird. Sorry if I wasn't talking earlier. It's loud in there. Here we go. Let's see now. I already checked the engine oils, but we can also check them from here. And let's see, it's system. There's your hydraulic quantities, which is good. As it should be. And there's no inbound write-ups, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> yeah, she's a good bird. What can I show you guys here? I think I've talked about pretty much everything here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, good old 737. If I remember correctly, I think somebody was asking, they were, they were asking, well, I probably talked about this before. What are these things are for? These little numbers? It's the flight number. Literally, for the flight number. So whichever flight number they have, let's say uh, flight 613, right? Whatever. 613. So they know what the flight number is. That's all. Very simple. If it was a four-digit flight number, they just simply drop the first digit. Yeah, don't ever play this prank with your co-workers. <laughs> the kneecap smasher. Oh my goodness. Okay, story time. Back when I was a young buck, my crew chief decided to play a joke on me and taught me a very valuable lesson. 
What you saw me doing is moving the horizontal stabilizer, the trim for the horizontal stabilizer. Now the trim wheel is there so you can move it manually if needed. It can also be operated electrically as you saw from the yoke. So unbeknownst to me, my crew chief pulled out that little handle and said, go ahead and sit down. I pulled that chair up close and sat down proper and my crew chief proceeded on hitting the switch from the FO side. As you would guess, that thing spun around and smashed my kneecap. Don't worry, nothing broke or anything like that. And I looked over to my crew chief and I said, why did you do that? And he told me, so you pay attention to your surroundings, dear boy. Lesson learned. Oh wait, before we go, come on, we gotta switch the guns. All right, let's get out of here. And we're back to an Airbus. Hello, beautiful. Just got done with the tire pressures. This one's going to Kona. Another ETOP flight. Busy schedule today. Took a little check. Make sure everything's a-okay, as usual. There you go. Bark for me, baby. Bark for me. <laughs> and that is your famous barking dog in the Airbus, the PTU, Power Transfer Unit. I made a whole video just for that, go check it out, but this is what it sounds like inside the airplane. <laughs> the barking dog. Ah, this is what I'm after. There you go, looking good. This is actually one of our brand new 321 Neos. Brand spanking clean. Look at that. That a speck of dirt. That is gorgeous. I love a clean airplane. Got some accumulators up there. That's a reservoir for hydraulics. Got a, a flat track right there. Torque tube, or it's not really a torque tube, but it acts like one for the track uh, or the flap sink. Basically for your flat power control unit. They call it the flat PCU. Almost like the 737 I showed you earlier, the PCU operates a mechanical transmission system which moves the flaps together. It's a hydromechanical unit that powers the transmission system. All right guys, so far so good. Everything is working out except for one little thing. Poor oxygen. That is below minimal limits for ETOPS flight. Don't know if you heard me proper, but I said it's below ETOPS limits. Our minimum limits is 1350 PSI. We gotta change those bottles out. Well, all right, boys and girls, let's get at it. I right, got the torque wrench ready. Let's see now. We got to make sure all our tools are clean because we're working with oxygen. And here is where the oxygen lives on the Airbus 321 Neo. There's two of them because it's an ETOP frame. So one right there and another one right there. These are the composite style or I forgot the, the material they use, but it's very lightweight, very easy to change. Take that apart, take that apart, take the overpressure line off, take off the main line. Obviously, we have to close it first, and then it pops right out. You'll see, it's easy. And we got our handy dandy leak detector in my pocket. I'll show you later. This is kind of cool. Uh, these are the brand new style of bottles, and they are very lightweight. Older bottles were actually heavy, heavy steel tanks. These new bottles are composite material, basically comprised of uh, lightweight aluminum shell and wrapped with Kevlar. Very cool stuff. And it definitely makes it easier on my back. Taking these things in and out is a pain when they're steel bottles. But anyway, we uh, close off the bottles. My partner upstairs already pulled the proper circuit breaker and tagged it out. New parts are on their way. And here's a nice little glimpse inside one of the equipment bays inside the 321neo. Also remember what I mentioned earlier, always use clean tools when dealing with oxygen. Oxygen and grease do not mix as a chance of combustion. The line I'm pointing at right there, the small one, that's the overpressure line. In case there was a fire or some kind of an overheat of the bottle, it would discharge the oxygen overboard. These bottles are specifically for the flight crew. The proper terminology is aviators breathing oxygen. What differentiates this type of oxygen from any other type of oxygen is that it's 99.5% pure oxygen with less than 0.01% moisture content. This is very crucial, especially for aircraft. Remember, these airplanes fly at very high altitudes. You do not want any kind of moisture within the system. The typical pressure in the full bottle is usually between 
1800 to 2100 PSI. So there's carriers out there that have the ability to service the bottle on site. There's special equipment, they just pull it up to the aircraft and service the bottle. Our carrier is a little bit different. We like to change the bottles out and send them out to our shop. We have a dedicated oxygen shop just for this. Not only will they service the bottle, but they are also hydrostatically tested. Hydrostatic testing is a process to determine the strength and integrity of the pressurized vessel. There's a very specific stamp on the bottle itself that we also inspect. If it's getting close to the due date of the hydrostat, then we change the bottle out, no matter how much oxygen has got left in there. As I finish loosening up all the lines, now I gotta take off the clamps that hold the bottle in place. Oh, in case you were wondering, this is part of ATA Chapter 35, Oxygen. But overall, it's not a hard job. It's very easy. I'll speed this up a little bit. I don't want you sitting here and getting bored. Once everything is loosened up, now the bottle is ready to come out. I'll put on the protective caps to make sure nothing gets damaged. And then out with the old, in with the new. On to the next bottle. It's interesting, uh, very rarely we have to actually change out both bottles. It's either one or the other, but this time around, I guess, luck would have it, both were below limits, so, huh, why not? My partner already brought the new bottles, and here we go. I bet you you're asking yourself, well, how did the bottles deplete in the first place? Was there some kind of an emergency? Did they have to use it? Well, no, not quite. You see, before every flight, pilots test the bottles, or the oxygen system, I should say. They want to make sure that the oxygen system is working properly. Oh, side note, there's the leak detector. It's basically soapy water. Anyway, every single time they test the system, it depletes the system a little bit. Hence why you have the bottle pressure dropping down. By the way, maintenance also tests the system as well. When we do our overnight checks, we have to test the system. Okay, here we go. We have got the bottle back in. We're putting the final torque. I already torqued the rest of those things. We use calibrated torque wrenches that is issued by our company. There you go. Oh man, it's getting hot in here. All right, final torque. We are good. Now, all we gotta do is slowly open these bottles very gently. Quarter turn, wait, quarter turn, wait. You have to be very, very gentle with these bottles. A lot of PSI inside. You don't wanna surge the system. So, quarter turn, wait 30 seconds. Once everything is torqued down, everything is secure, bottles fully open, now we get the leak detector. Like I said before, it's basically soapy water. What am I looking for? Bubbles. That's what I'm looking for. Literally, just bubbles. I got the rag down there so you know it doesn't drip down all over the place. But yeah, that's what it is. So leak check was good. I didn't see any bubbles there. No worries, no worries. Right. Here you go, sir. All right. Just need to awesome. back in, and oxygen up. is tip top. Cool. And you can got... breathe all the way to breathe oxygen all the way to Hawaii. Yeah, that's the most important part. Yeah, and then, yeah. and then need to... Okay, we dispatched that one real good. It went off to Hawaii and on to the next office. A beautiful triple seven. Go round two. Back to international. All right, this one just came in, but it is going to go back out later tonight to Sydney, I believe. Woo, look at that. Come on, there it is. Little corporate jets. Those things are like little rockets. Looking good, looking good. A big 
there's something cool for you. You see these two little holes right here? These little, uh, little stickers out right above them says warning. High powered hot air exhaust. Well, what these are actually are exhausts for the center hydraulic pumps. There's uh, two sets of hydraulic pumps for the center system. Two that are ran electrically and two that are air driven. Those are for the air driven hydraulic pumps for this aircraft, the 777 obviously. And when those things are on, man oh man, it gets really, really hot. Lots of hot air comes out. Pretty cool. If you guys didn't know, this airplane actually has eight hydraulic pumps. Yeah. Stig, stop lying to people. You know that's wrong information. Watch, I'm gonna call myself out here in a second. Here, check it out. You think I was crazy when I said eight pumps, huh? So get this. You have left electric pump, you have right electric pump, you have two center electric pumps, then you have two center air pumps or air driven hydraulic pumps, and then you have two engine driven pumps. That makes a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Voila! Eight different pumps. That is insane. And here's the part where I'm going to call myself out. Not eight pumps, Stig, nine pumps. And it's staring you right in the face, right above all those buttons and knobs that I was pointing, right above it, a guarded switch that says Ram Air Turbine, the RAT. On this aircraft, the RAT actually functions as another pump. Not only does it provide electrical power in an emergency situation, but it also supplies hydraulic power to the center system. So there you go. Do better, Stig, do better. <laughs> Yeah, you'll never run out of hydraulic power with this airplane. So yeah, what I found out is they're actually, uh, they're repositioning this aircraft and I'm not the one repositioning, so. But it's all right, no big deal. They'll take this to the other gates and a uh, different crew will work this one. But it's all good. Still, it was nice to see this beauty. As the day keeps going, more airplanes come on in, more airplanes going out. Never a dull moment. I'm jumping from airplane to airplane here. All right, this is the last flight of the night. It was a Terminator, so it stays overnight. So all I do is just give it a little oil and send her on her way to the hangar. Oh, I can't help it. Hold on, hold on. Let's see, we gotta make this right. I'm sorry, I, I just, my sense of humor. I can't help myself, it's just funny. <laughs> I can't help it. Anyway, I hope you guys had fun. I will see you guys here bright and early in the morning for some more fun. I'll see y'all later. Bye. Good morning, everybody. It's another wonderful day. What a beautiful day it is, or it's turning out to be. Let's go. Time for some fun. Don't forget that. Everybody wonders how I always get my steps in. Up and down jet bridges all day long. <laughs> Fun. Okay, so most of you know what ailerons are. These are the ailerons and they control the longitudinal axis or basically allows the aircraft to roll, okay? But on wider body jets, such as this 777, 747 as well has it, just basically all the big wide body jets also have an inboard aileron, most notably called the flapperon as you can see right there the one that thing that's drooping so not only does it act as an aileron it also acts as a flap 
So at low speeds, the flaperon and the aileron work together. But as soon as it reaches cruise speed and is flying fast at high speeds, the outboard aileron locks out and it's only using the flaperon. This is to prevent torsion of the wing. It's more efficient at those speeds. There you go. Check it out. Here it is on takeoff. Watch how the aileron and the flaperon work together. As soon as we reach high speeds and getting into cruise altitude, I'll show you in a second here, the aileron will lock out and only thing you'll see moving around is the flaperon. That flapper on works a lot. It's constantly adjusting, constantly moving, even though the, it's minor, small little adjustments, but it's still moving all the time. Quite incredible. And forgive the very dirty wings. Sometimes seepage happens, it's normal. As long as it's not an active leak, that's all I care about. But here we go, a nice, beautiful landing. And that's how flaperons work. But we're not done. Let's go. Okay, one more <laughs> on flight controls. Okay, on a 777, when most people take a look at the tail, they look real close right there and they see that little portion right there. And most people think that's a split rudder. It's not. On a 777, that's actually called a rudder tab. Believe it or not, it moves in the same direction as the rudder. So if the rudder kicks over left, the little tab will also kick over left. It basically helps assist even more in yaw. So the rudder is able to deflect about 27 degrees and the rudder tab matches it exactly per degree. So if the rudder turns 27 degrees full, the tab will turn 27 degrees full. In combination, you'll have about 54 degrees of deflection from the center line of the, the body. But yeah. Rudder tab, not rudder split on a triple seven. As the beautiful lumbering giant gets pushed back, I sit there and I enjoy it. No better feeling in the world knowing that you dispatched a safe aircraft. And here's your example of the rudder tab in motion. They're doing a flight control check. They move around all the flight control surfaces, making sure it's free and clear. It gives you a good idea of how that tab functions and moves around. Oh, check this out. Look what I came in. This is my next flight right here. It's the Stand Up to Cancer aircraft. Check out these arrows. From far, they look like regular arrows, right? Well, I mean, they are regular arrows, but if you get closer to the arrows, look closer. Their names of everybody that's donated to cancer awareness and cancer research. Every single one of these arrows is full of names. I can't remember which one. Was it on this side or the other side? It's My name is up there somewhere. I just can't remember which one it is. Which side it's on. Or which arrow it's on. <laughs> but yeah. There you go. I can't remember. I have to go look it up again. That's a beauty. Okay, let's go. Check everything out. Look at the parameters. As always, same old, same old. Nothing special. Check engine oils. 
hydraulics, status. We'll get the, actually we'll get it all aligned for them as well. This one's due out pretty soon. So that's the Adaroos. I did a poor job of explaining this. Let me pause it here and let me explain to you exactly what this does. Adaroos. It stands for Air Data Inertial Reference Units or system. On the Airbus family, there's three of them. This collects data from the pitot probes and the static ports, as well as takes data from the TATs, total air temperatures, as well as angle of attacks, AOAs. But that's not all. The system also has a ring laser gyroscope, accelerometers, and also talks to GPS. It takes all this information and provides raw data to the pilots. It gives position, speed, altitude, Overall, it lets the aircraft know where it is, where it's been, and where it's heading. Ah, about nine or 10 minutes or so. Somebody asked, I can't remember who asked me, but they wanted to know where they keep the ACARS paper on the Airbus, it's right there. Matter of fact, they also have a spare bulb kit. Here, let's take a look at it real quick. Pretty much all aircraft have this, all major aircraft. They have a spare bulb kit. Mostly maintenance uses it on outstations or where you know just not enough facilities but pilots can use certain things out of here but yeah got some bulbs even got a massive fat uh, i think this is a relay not a relay that's a that's a fuse that's a fuse there you go pretty cool huh the glory of aviation <laughs> what you thought it was all fun and games Welcome to the dreaded ATA chapter, chapter 38, water and waste. And this is the waste part of it. Toilets to tires, kids, toilets to tires. We do it all, we fix it all. Even when I have to stick my hand down there and unclog a toilet. You see, aircraft maintenance is such a rounded field. Everything. We're mechanics, we're troubleshooters, we're metallurgists, we're plumbers, woodworkers. You name it, we do it. But in this particular scenario, yeah. Most of the time when uh, you're a junior uh, mechanic and uh, you're fresh, th th this is usually reserved for the new guys. You got to pay your dues. That's the way it works. Don't complain about it. But I don't care how much seniority you have. And look at me. I got plenty of seniority. Yeah, ATA Chapter 38 will always find you no matter what. And you know what? Smile. Do your job. Stop complaining about it. That's part of the job. There's no crying in aviation. <laughs> Toilets to tires, ladies and gentlemen. Toilets to tires. Guess who gets to dig this out? That's right, maintenance. Oh, this should be fun. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the club. Uh, fun. Okay, so somebody decided to put a whole bunch of these in there. Don't do that. Toilet paper goes in there. That goes in here. See? Works as advertised. You can only follow instructions. Follow instructions. As the next aircraft rolled in, this one actually came in with an interesting write-up. Pilots are able to communicate to ground and especially to maintenance when they have an inbound write-up. This particular flight encountered some turbulence, apparently a little bit heavy turbulence, and the pilots was very concerned about it, so they put it in the logbook. This turned into a very, very interesting scenario. Went upstairs, debriefed the pilot, got all the information, and now I want to see what the airplane says. Uh, report, pilot reports he hit some turbulence and he thought he might have hit a little bit of severe turbulence so as a precaution he did put it in the book but now what we got to do is pull up turbulence reports so that's done through the mcdu or the load factor i should say all this information the aircraft records everything and when i say everything everything flight control movements, fuel consumption, load factors, G-loads. It's constantly collecting data. 
stores it into the digital flight data recorder. So when this kind of event happens, we are following very strict maintenance manual procedures. Once we access the data, now we gotta analyze it. I start looking for very particular codes. Every code has a meaning behind it. So in this situation, I'm looking for a code that reads 5,000 or anything in a 5,000 range. Now check out all this data. This is really cool. So look up top where I got it underlined. It says a 9,000 code, which we got lucky because 9,000 code is a normal code. Now, if it read anything in the 5,000s, that would have indicated a severe turbulence event. Next, look at the bottom portion. Look at where it says S4. The aircraft records everything that's going on within its vertical, longitudinal, and lateral movement. It takes a snapshot from one to three seconds of intervals and records the G loads. That's what those numbers represent. Since it didn't give me a 5,000 code and just hit the normal 9,000 code, all it recorded is the G loads on landing which is completely normal. But the 5000 code didn't pop up. That means they had very light turbulence. It might've just felt very heavy at the moment. We got lucky, honestly, because if it was genuinely a severe turbulence, the aircraft is completely grounded. The inspection portion of this is very extensive. It could turn into a fuel tank dive, believe it or not. Yeah, it, it becomes very convoluted. Safety is always priority. A shout out to Captain Gary. He was the pilot in command. He was so nice about it. And he was just like, man, I don't know what we hit, but we hit something. But I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I put it in a book and I was like, don't worry about it, Captain. All good. We'll take care of it. And he was so uh, genuine about it because he gave me his phone number. He said, can you please call me back? Let me know how it turns out. I surely did. I called him back. I to give him a text message and uh, said, hey, airplane's good to go. Don't worry about it. But yeah, anyway. I hope you see this video. It'll be funny. Anyway, on to the next one. Okay, all right, let's go. Back to the wide bodies. Back to the 777. Oh, all right. My partner's doing the outside. I'm doing the inside. Let's go have some fun. Let's take out the parameters and make sure everything's okay. Oh, you know what? I messed up yesterday. Remember how I told you there's uh, eight hydraulic pumps? Yeah, I completely forgot about one extra pump. The rat. The rat is actually a pump on this aircraft as well. Yeah, I totally goofed. So yeah, not eight pumps, actually nine pumps hydraulic pumps on this aircraft, which is directly tied into the center hydraulic system. There you go, see? I don't know everything. Sometimes uh, my colleagues have to call me out, which they did. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, triple seven, nine hydraulic pumps. But this is your last resort. You definitely never want to use this one. I know I mentioned it before, but yeah, I, I made a, a correction video. Somebody asked for a tour of the cabin, and this is a 777-300. That's going to take me forever to do. So here's a nice little fast-forward motion for you. Doing my cabin walkthrough. Insert the flight of the bumblebees. Make sure we have no status messages. We don't. That's exactly what I want to see. You can check out door page there landing gear also will give us parameters on the tire pressures from the tire pressure monitoring system just all sorts of fun information obviously the camera i think i showed you before there you go there's my partner doing the walk around <laughs> but overall we're good just want to go into maintenance info display and look at some of the parameters let's see what's going on oh look at that one of the backup generators needs some servicing. We'll take care of that. That's not a big deal. Do the outside first and then we'll take care of that. All right, there's your G90. Let's go service the backup generator. It's gonna be right down over here. All right, so these are the servicing ports. The forward one is for the backup generator. This back, the, the aft one is for the main generator. So. We want to service this one. Now just quick disconnect fittings. First things first, you want to always attach the pressure relief and the overflow hose as such. Make sure to relieve the pressure. There you go. 
Once again, seepage, it happens. That's why fluid sometimes gets depleted. But we monitor this as long as it's not an active leak. So if it needs servicing, we just simply service it. A couple of my buddies were walking by and they're like, hey, you need help? And I said, yeah, go ahead. You pump and I'll film. So as you can see, and one hose is servicing it, pumping fluid in, and then the other one is the overflow. There's a standpipe inside the IDG. Once it reaches a sufficient level, it will dump the excess. And that's how we know when the IDG is full of oil and properly serviced. That's about it. Close that up and then we go upstairs to double check the parameters, making sure that everything's good and, it's, and it reads normal. All right, that was easy. Hey, look at that. Back to normal. That's exactly what I wanted to see. All right, let's finish this up. Man, I'm getting old, running up and down those jet bridges. Stairs. <laughs> oh my goodness. Alrighty. Coming up on our last flight of the night. Right, check it out. This is how they fuel the aircraft. There's underground pipes that run from a fuel farm far away. And they got these vehicles that come up, double hoses, and bam, right there. Pretty cool. Actually, the 777 is quite interesting. You can actually fuel from both wings, but the fuel panel receptacle is only on the left wing. What I meant to say is the fuel control panel, but there are receptacles on both sides so you can fuel from both wings. You know, speaking of fuel, check this out. See this little uh, pipe right there? If you were ever flying on a 777 or any major wide body aircraft, you'll notice a pipe sticking out right there. That's for the jettison system. Come on, let's go up sailors. I'll show you the panel. Here we go. So, as I was saying, downstairs, fuel jettisoning, jettisoning, or jettison. For the 777, it's up here. It's almost similar to the 787, slightly different. Pretty easy. Oh, what pilots will do if they need to, you know, shed some weight so they won't have a uh, overweight landing. Basically arm the system right here, pull this out, how much fuel to remain, decrease or increase and hit the magic guard buttons right there and then it will start spewing out the wing yeah that's about it but this one is good to go this one's actually flying out to sydney here we go um that's what it looks like that's what jettisoning fuel looks like they usually do it over the ocean but sometimes they have to do it whenever they can you know it's if it's an emergency it's an emergency I'm sure everybody remembers that whole Delta incident. I hope you all had some good fun. It was a nice, exciting weekend, wasn't it? We got to see lots of cool stuff. But that's it, yeah. As I said, this thing is going out to Sydney. And this guy gets to go home. Take care, guys. I'll see you on the next adventure. Later. That's a wrap, folks. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. I hope really it was not too boring and you're not tired of me talking. <laughs> See you on the next adventure.